Now I gotta figure out why the keyboard wasn't working. Hi, I'm Christopher. Um, uh, <laughs> seriously, I have no keyboard focus. It's very annoying. Um, I like to build things. Uh, this particular thing I built uh, mostly out of cardboard, but we also used an Arduino to make the light on the top of the TARDIS work. Uh, that was a lot of fun. Um, and I work for a company called Radius Networks. Uh, we build products around proximity and location, um, and uh, one of the things that we do a lot with is beacons. We actually build and sell uh, the hardware devices as well as a bunch of services that kind of go on top of it. Um, and this is our office. It's the powerhouse in DC, one of two locations where you don't have to give a street or number in DC um, if you want to send a letter to it. Uh, it's really cool. Um, it is a, like a 100-year-old renovated powerhouse uh, kind of turned in, into an office space. And we all work on a mezzanine, and um, the doors to come in are, the, are down low uh, on the main floor uh, where, where everyone will walk in, and as they, as they come in, then you stomp up these loud metal stairs, but you don't know who's, who's coming in, uh, which made us wonder, like, well, we're a proximity company. Uh, we can figure this out. Like, wouldn't it be really cool if um, some music would just magically play when somebody... Uh, walks into the office. And so we, of course, sort of, of course started talking about, like, cool, what do we play when the CEO walks into uh, the office and comes up the stairs? And the same thing when we talk about the chief financial officer, uh, what, what's he going to do when he walks up, um, you know, carrying all his ledgers and things that he carries. That was pretty obvious. And then I was faced with a real dilemma, which was, what am I going to play when I walk in? And I thought about it for a long time, and then it seemed um, just so, so blatantly obvious. I was very happy that I had the first slot talking because um, I thought I'd be the very first person at this RubyConf to rickroll you. <laughs> okay, so we have this thing, let's build it. Um, what do we need? Uh, we're gonna need three different things. Um, first, we're gonna need speakers, some way to actually play the music connected to a small computer. Um, we're gonna need a mobile app, so something on your phone. Um, luckily, you always carry your phone with you, so this is a good representation of where you are. Um, and then we're going to need a beacon. Uh, and you probably already know about computers and uh, mobile phones, but um, I, I don't know if everyone's familiar with what exactly is a beacon. So um, there's a couple of different things that could be a beacon. The one I'm talking about today are the Bluetooth low energy beacons, or the BLE beacons, or the Bluetooth smart, or the Bluetooth 4.0, which are all the same thing. Um, they're just marketing terms that the Bluetooth SIG has come, come up with to talk about these things. Uh, I think most people tend to have settled on Bluetooth low energy at this point. Um, and what exactly are one of these uh, beacons? Uh, it's kind of like a PA system. It just makes announcements over and over, and it ignores everything else. Uh, that means that you don't connect to it. You, um, it doesn't know if you've heard it. It doesn't, doesn't know pretty much anything. It's just sending out the same thing over and over again. Um, and what it's sending out is just identifiers. Uh, this is nothing complicated. Um, it looks something like this, which is just a big UUID and plus a couple other numbers. Uh, and, and that's kind of all that it has. And you can use these identifiers as like a foreign key you, like you would in a database or as just, you know, something to do a lookup to figure out um, what it means when you see that beacon. Um, so there's a couple of different types of beacons, uh, and, and choices are good, right? It's, it's, it's never um, bad to have too many players, too many cooks in the kitchen. The obvious one is uh, iBeacon. Uh, so this is a spec by Apple. And um, whenever I talk about beacons, I almost always mean this. And I kind of use the word beacon synonymous with um, a beacon with iBeacon technology, which is the way you're supposed to say it. Uh, this came out with iOS 7. They introduced it. Um, and it works really good on iOS. Um, but the iBeacon spec isn't completely free of proprietary uh, intellectual uh, property. Um, so there's this thing called Alt Beacon. Um, 
And to be completely honest, this is a little bit of a shameless plug because um, my company authored that spec. Um, <laughs> and, and it's also a little different than some of the other specifications that are out there uh, because uh, it, was, it was written with the idea of interoperability uh, and it's supposed to work one-to-one one -one with iBeacons. Um, and in fact, we have a number of hardware devices that do both and you wouldn't notice the difference. Uh, between the two. It, it's just kind of a mechanism that we, we were using. Uh, and then finally, there are other proprietary beacons. Um, these can do some really cool stuff, um, include other sensors. Um, you know, you might notice on Kickstarter, these sorts of things will come around um, that, you know, help, help you find your lost bike or have an accelerometer or temperature sensor and, and can do other cool things. But these are out, outside of the scope of what I'm talking about, which are the simple BLE beacons. Um, so cool, uh, we, we kind of know the different parts we're going to need, um, let's, let's kind of whiteboard and walk through exactly what we would do to make all of this work. So first we're going to need a beacon, uh, we'll, we'll set that up, uh, we'll need a mobile device, um, some sort of Ruby backend, um, you know, server, and then uh, the thing that's actually going to play the audio. And what happens first is the beacon will broadcast, broadcast out its identifiers and it just shouts these out, um, not knowing anything around it, um, sending those and the phone is going to notice that. So um, on the, the operating system on the phone will wake, wake up uh, the app and tell it that I've seen this beacon. That app can now post off to the server uh, which will turn in turn tell whatever needs to play the music that it should go ahead and play the music. Um, and this is, of course, the point where the epic music actually plays. Um, so cool. So what exactly are all these kind of abstract, weird uh, drawings? Um, so if we we're going to build it, how, would, how, did the, how does this fit all together? And um, what I do is, for the demo for this talk, um, I built it all together. So everything in the box all, all runs on a Raspberry Pi. Um, and it's all sitting there together. Um, and then we have the phone kind of as, as, as a separate system. And these are the two things that need to interact together. Um, and this is the actual system that I built. Um, I brought it along. So you can see we have Raspberry Pi. It's got a little Bluetooth nub plugged in. Um, I had some speakers. Uh, the USB hub, it was only for power. And um, you'll notice that there's a network cable because it needed to be connected because that was the only, the only way that um, we could actually tell the Pi to play anything since the beacon that's sticking out here would only broadcast out. It, it wasn't receiving anything back. All right. So we have this epic music system running on a Raspberry Pi. Um, there's a few things that we needed to do for us. Um, one is broadcast as a beacon. So if you're just using um, a Bluetooth, uh, just a generic Bluetooth module, uh, you can still have it broadcast as a beacon. Um, and luckily, the, um, the command line that you need to run is, is pretty intuitive. <laughs> um, so you can do that. It's um, using the Blue Z stack, which is kind of the, the drivers for Linux for uh, Bluetooth. Um, and uh, use something called HCI tool. And you can basically just command your uh, Bluetooth radio to broadcast something. And I kind of highlighted um, the different identifiers. So the thing that's kind of in the dark red is this, the main UUID. And then the other two identifiers are that kind of mustard and in, in, um, uh, dark blue. Um, or the. Uh, the easy approach uh, is to just plug in a Bluetooth-powered beacon. And so it looks almost the exact same thing as a, um, a Bluetooth radio, but it has our firmware running on it, and uh, you can just configure it in advance. All it needs is power, and it'll broadcast. So that's kind of the cheap, easy way that I um, was able to get it to broadcast as a beacon, or if I wanted to have more... Um, if I want to cover more doors. So if you're walking into the office, we have two doors, and I need beacons at every entrance. So when, when you walk past them, I'll know that you're there. 
Uh, okay, so now we need a music player. We have it, the system broadcasts. Um, we need something that's going to listen um, for events and play the music. Um, and I did it with a Sinatra app, which um, is very complicated. <laughs> and um, you'll see, we'll start at the bottom. Uh, it takes a post. Um, when the post comes in, it just converts the param. It looks for a param called name. And then what we do is we call, it calls up to the method at the top, which is play. Um, all I'm gonna do is shout out to a little command line app called mpeg321, um, and then I resolve the path and tack on .mp3. So if I wanna add more songs for other people, um, I would just you know add chris.mp3 to um, the Raspberry Pi, and you can change out whatever song you wanted. Um, now, since I want it all to run on one device, and I didn't want to have like a server and like a Raspberry Pi um, connected somewhere with sockets going and, and you know pushing events up and down, um, I wanted to just tunnel out to the internet. And so this was um, an easy way to kind of uh, have my server run within the firewall that's at my office, uh, connected to that network there. And um, I just used a tool called Ngrok. Um, this thing is amazing. Uh, I, I discovered it while I was working on this uh, little project, um, but it actually gives you like introspected tunnels. So you can see what's going over the wire uh, for the stuff that you've tunneled out. So if you've ever worked with webhooks and other things and you want to test them, um, just check this out. Okay, um, so the iOS app. So um, I have an iPhone, so I, I decided I, I wanted to write an iOS app, um, and I used Ruby Motion for it because we were talking about it, RubyConf. Um, so this is a little more scary. Um, this is how you tell the core location APIs to listen for a beacon. Um, and there's a couple of things, like I say, look for any beacons with a specific UUID and then tell me about it like in any possible time that you, that you can. Um, and so I would set this up when I first when I first launched the app, I, I set up all these things and I register with the operating system. Please tell me about these beacons. Um, and then I need to add, implement some sort of a callback. So I have a, a method that's just something, a, a delegate to core location. So, but all that means is that when um, the core location system sees uh, something happening, um, it's going to uh, notice that and um, call back to my app and let me know. What's really cool uh, about this and what was novel about when uh, Apple introduced iBeacons was that this happens even if my app is in the background, and it also happens even if it, like you went through and explicitly uh, you know, terminated the app, um, if the phone is locked in, in your pocket, you know, all these sorts of things, it gives you an extra little hook, that event that you need to make something happen um, that you just didn't have before. Um, and then once we do all that, um, we are going to post it up to the server. Um, on Ruby Motion, I used a library called Bubble Wrap, which, if you've done anything with Ruby Motion, Bubble Wrap is awesome. Um, because in order to do this same amount of, of work of just doing HTTP post, and Ruby, we're spoiled by it because you can do it in three lines. Um, but if you were trying to use the, the APIs, the native APIs, it, it winds up being something like 30 lines of code in order to, to handle all of that. Um, so cool. Now we have, we basically have a working system. We have the two components, um, the, the Raspberry Pi that's going to be listening to things and the phone that will, will react to it, take that event and um, post it back to the Raspberry Pi. So it's kind of a full circle of, and the events are coming out of um, the music player um, so that the phone can react to being near it and it posts it back and lets the, um, it sends it off to the phone which then turns around and, and sends it back to the actual uh, Raspberry Pi system. Cool, so we have a working prototype. Um, let's go over, um, I'd like to talk a little more about how uh, iBeacons work, in, in particular about some of the misconceptions and um, the other uh, 
kind of nuances of working with them because there's definitely a lot of things when you're working with iBeacons that's not obvious. Um, so a couple of uh, main, of, of the big misconceptions that we see over and over again are, um, uh, there we go, are, are that the beacons actually deliver the content. Um, uh, they don't, they just send out identifiers. And um, I feel like I should just be, be up here just saying that over and over again, because that, that's something that seems that's hard for people to really ingest. Um, and people tend to actually think that they're getting something off of these little um, Bluetooth devices that they're, you know, they need to get the content and the pictures or um, God help us all more coupons off of these devices. And that doesn't work that way at all. The way it works is it sends out those identifiers and you, you see those and, um, and then that gives you a chance to uh, react to them. Um, go look up those identifiers in some, some other place, um, pull those down um, on, you know, onto the phone or to whatever device is, is actually using them and uh, take action on it. So it's, it's really is just providing you the event and none of the actual data or messaging or content. Uh, the other one is that the beacons know when they're detected. They don't have a clue. Um, they are just um, dumb broadcasters. And all they do are, are announce their identifiers over and over again. Um, the, the way it works is, is actually using a Bluetooth ad packet. And so as it's sending out these, these advertising packets, it, it contains a couple of bytes of information. That's it. And um, sends it out. Uh, this one's important. Uh, we haven't talked about the distance estimate at all um, in our demo. Um, it was just uh, if you see if you see the beacon at all, take this action. Um, but one of the things that you can do with the beacon is you can use the RSSI, the relative signal uh, intensity, to figure out uh, approximately. It's very important. Approximately, how far away you are from the beacon. Now this uses Bluetooth, it uses RF, and neither one of these, uh, Bluetooth wasn't intended um, for figuring out how far away you are from something. So there are other RF based things that you can use um, that are more accurate. But this is great because it's built into my phone by default and so out the door I have something in my pocket that can estimate um, distance. The problem is um, on on your phone, like you get get back an estimate. It's in you know you can convert it to meters using the signal strength, and there's um, you can configure the devices to have um, like a baseline broadcast power. Uh, and what that is is you configure it, you set it up, and you set something exactly one meter away, and you figure out what the signal strength is at that one meter away. Um, and it's all very environmental. So if I plugged one in underneath the podium and I wanted to measure one meter in front of it, it would make a difference whether or not this podium was wood or uh, metal and how much of the signal you'll see. Um, and a lot of, we've seen a lot of use cases where folks come in and they're like, oh, it'd be great. I want to use beacons. We're going to do something amazing um, at our cash register. And I need to know when the person is the second person in line. And that's just not gonna work. Because even standing still at one meter away in the lab, like under control you know, situation, you'll see the, um, the distance estimate jump around. And you can do things like, you know, like running averages to kind of figure these things out. But um, it's, it's not very accurate. And over enough time, you could probably get accurate, but that's not gonna work for somebody standing in line at the cash register. Um, and uh, the other thing to know is that um, the accuracy gets less um, accurate the further away you get. So if you are, you know, immediate, like you want to be within an inch of, of the beacon, you want to hold your phone right up next to it, and you want to know if whether or not somebody is holding the phone right next to it, that's actually pretty reliable. And once you get out to a couple of meters away, um, it kind of starts to jump around. But when you're at 15, 20 meters away, um, 
it, it'll be all over the place. And sometimes um, the Bluetooth on the phone will be like, I don't even know what the RSSI is. So, all right. Um, So uh, one thing to know um, is that not all the platforms behave the same way. Um, uh, a lot of people tend to think that you can set up an app on uh, your iPhone and have it look for all the beacons that are out there. Uh, you can't, that's not allowed by the, the core location APIs. That might be allowed on other platforms. Um, and you know, it might, might be allowed on other platforms that are using the Android Beacon Library, which is um, another slightly shameless plug, um, which is a which is a completely open source implementation re-implementation of um, kind of how the core location beacon uh, API works. Um, but being on on Android, you have a much more open platform, um, for better or worse, uh, for uh, exactly what you can do. Um, all right, the other thing, another misconception is that the beacons track you. Um, there's been some interesting things in the news where I think um, in London they put a bunch of beacons in trash cans and then people flipped out and made them rip them out of the trash cans. And then um, in New York they were doing something similar where they had some sort of big fashion show and somebody made an amazing app that interacted to, to you wandering around the city and so they used old phone booths because who uses payphones anymore, um, and they installed a bunch of beacons which could make the apps do, do interesting things. And of course, people flipped out, and the mayor announced that they were gonna have to go and rip all of these things out. Um, uh, that was very frustrating, um, working at a place where we think about this stuff all day long. Um, the beacons aren't tracking you, they're not doing anything. They are giving your phone something that they can trigger to make the tracking happen, but there's a lot of other ways to do this. Um, there's nothing kind of inherently um, bad about how the, the beacon system works. It's not more invasive. Um, and you know, it, the thing I like about it is it's completely up to you to control whether or not you leave it on or turn it off. And, and um, you know, on iOS, it's all opt-in. Um, and so it's, it's a pretty good way of, uh, actually using it to engage people. It's really helpful when I want to play music when I walk into the office, that's cool. If um, you know, I'm going to my, my local sports ball event and I don't want to hear um, events or, or offers to upgrade my seat because uh, seriously, no more coupons, um, then I can, you can opt out of that sort of thing. And that's, um, I actually really like the way it works and I get frustrated when you hear um, you know, politicians politicianing and, and doing their thing and causing some sort of massive backlash and saving the day by having a bunch of phone booths, um, Bluetooth beacons ripped out. Awesome. All right, well, thank you guys very much.